Let's pray this morning. God, I pray that that as we open your word, that we can humble ourselves to what your word has to say to us, that you'll use me to speak your truth and that we can learn. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We are studying in the book of Jude, and so if you have your Bibles, go to the very, very back and then go back one book. So the last book in the Bible is Revelation. The one right before that is a small book called the book of Jude. It's just one chapter long, so it's a really short one, and uh, we, we jumped into it two weeks ago, so this is our, our third week in this series. Uh, just looking at Jude, he's the, the brother of Jesus, but yet he chooses to identify himself as a servant of Christ instead of the brother of Jesus. Uh, and he's writing, and he wants to write about salvation, but he says, listen, I see a problem in your church. You've got these false teachers. They have snuck their way into your church, and they're bringing in stuff that's not, it's not biblical. And so I need you, to, verse 3, I, I, I am compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's people. I want you to fight for the faith. I want you to know what you believe and be confident about it. What does this say? Read this, study this, and learn this, and know what it Know what it says. And you have to be on your guard. Because if you don't know what this says and you don't know what you believe, then you may go two directions. You may become one of the false teachers. You create up your own doctrine and you start promoting that. And, well, I think this is right, so I'm just going to teach this. Or you become a follower of the false. And you inadvertently are led astray. So we must know what this says. We must know what the Bible says. We must study this. And so in his, in his book, uh, in his letter to this church, he goes on and he, he, he writes to those he cares about. And we're going to pick up the reading in verse 5. Uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 5. Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt. Now, Judah is going to say, listen, I want you guys to remember back to the things that God has done. But I, w- I want you to make a little note here. He starts this off by saying, though you already know all of this, that implies that his audience knows what he's going to talk about. And maybe his audience does. But as a preacher, I'm guilty of that. I've said this before. You all know the story of fill in the blank. And some of you might honestly know it, but some of you here today are sitting there going, I have no idea what you're talking about. You have totally lost me. And so to Jude's point, I would say, Jude, be careful. Maybe not everyone knows what we're talking about here. Verse 5, you already know all this, so let's see if we know all of this. Let's, let's go with Jude, and let's look back to the Old Testament examples that he's going to be talking about and seeing what points he's drawing from those points. So we're going to dig into this. So verse 5, though you already know all of this, no, we don't, Jude, so we're going to go back and, and dig into the Old Testament to see what it says. I want to remind you that the, remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, what we're going to do is I need you to put a bookmark or a pencil or something in this, in this here in Jude because we're going to go back to the Old Testament a couple times today. So put something here in Jude, and let's go back to Numbers. Back to Numbers. That's the fourth book of the Bible at the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. So keep one finger here in Jude and go back to Numbers chapter 14. If you remember your Old Testament history, now somebody will say, why do we have to remember Old Testament history? What good is the Old Testament to us? It doesn't apply to us anymore. We learn a lot from it. But most importantly, we see how God chose to bring about the Israelites and bring about the land seed and the, the blessing, the best part. How he chose people to bring about his son into this world. That's why we got to remember the Old Testament because that's how we got Jesus through the history of of the people. But in, in, in Numbers chapter 14, so background here, let's see how many of you uh, pop quiz in Old Testament uh, history. Ready? How did the, uh, the Israelites, how did the Israelites get to Egypt in the first place? Because they're in slavery. The Israelites in, in slavery in Egypt, how'd they get there in the first place? Hmm. Oh, good job. You get it right. Joseph. If you remember, if we go back, Joseph had some brothers. How many brothers did he have? 12, well, he had 11 brothers. He was the 12th one, so that's a trick question. Good job. And his brothers were a bit envious. Well, that was a highly dysfunctional family. Dad was definitely favoring one of them, so uh, to his brother's defense, it's what you get. The brothers sell him out. They, they literally sell him out uh, into slavery. And, and, and what you intended to harm me, God intended for good. So they sell him out as a slave, but he does good wherever he's placed. And he rises to power. 
And, and, and God uses him to protect people from a famine, and he protects the whole nation from a famine, and God's using him. And his brothers are, oh, they're hungry, and so they have a turn of heart, and they come to Egypt, and they say, can we buy food? And he goes, ha, ha, no, the tides have changed. But he doesn't smite them. He welcomes them, and they all come to Egypt. And they live there, and everything's going good, and there's lots of them. But then a new king, a new pharaoh comes to power and says, I don't know you. I don't know this Joseph guy. I'm going to make you my slaves because you're kind of, you're kind of scaring me. I'm kind of concerned about this. So I'm going to put you all into slavery because I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. And that's what you're going to do. Well, the Israelites are like, this is miserable. We don't want to be slaves. We don't want to be here. And so they complain and they say, God, get us out of this. Get us out of this. And so God brings up a leader, Moses and, and Moses is kind of, oh, I don't think I can do it. And God's like, listen, you're going to do it. I'm going to send you Aaron. Get in there. I need you to do this job, please. So he goes and he says, let my people go. King Pharaoh says, no. And they go back and forth, a couple miracles, a couple plagues. Finally, he says, go, leave. And so they're free. We're free. We're no longer slaves. And you would think at this point they would be happy and they would be excited and they would never complain again. Some of you who are familiar with the story know that the word complaining in Israelites is like a synonym, okay? I'm sorry to say that, but read, read the story. I've included the references in there, but read it. They, they get out of slavery, and all they do is complain. Oh, God, I wish we were back in slavery. Oh, why did you leave us out here to die? Oh, we're so tired of walking. We want water. We want food. We're sick of the manna. We want oh, and blah, 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 blah. And God has got his, his, his patience is being tested. And then he comes to the point and says, that's it. I'm sick and tired of this. You, you, don't, you don't trust me. Ah, that's huge. You don't trust me. And that's why you're grumbling. If they, there's some notes in your, in, your, in your, there's some blank lines. Just write down grumble. Because that's what these people do, man. They just grumble. If you're in Numbers 14, Numbers 14, I don't want to read this. Numbers 14, verse 26 and 27. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites and I am sick and tired of it. God was gonna take the, the spies into the promised land. He did. He said, I want you to look at this area and see if we can take it back. Two of them come back and say, yep, we can do it. We trust you, God. We can do it. Ten of them come back and say, we can't do it, God. We don't trust you. It's too big. We can't do it. God says, that was the wrong, te- that was the wrong choice. You failed that test. And because you failed that test, you're going to have to wander for 40 years until all of you are dead. And then your children can take the promised land. Because they grumbled and they complained. And, and as I read this and I study this and I look at the Old Testament examples and I go back to Jude and I look at what Jude says, we're going to go back to Jude, Jude chapter, chapter 1. I think we're in verse 5 or 6. Jude says, hey, hey, do you remember? Do you remember how God got the people out of slavery? Okay, I brought them. He delivered his people out of Egypt from slavery, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Those who were consumed with grumbling and complaining. He said, you, you missed it. That's, you, you, you. Your lack of faith drove you away. And so I look at that, and, I, and as, I, as I read the rest of this, and a couple more verses, we're going to look at them here in a second, I see that when we reject God's authority, it can cause us to, to leave the faith. That when we reject God's authority, rebelling against God's authority can cause apostasy. That is, that is, a, that is a fancy, if you're playing Scrabble, you get some points for that last word there. Um, especially if you play it on a triple word score. Uh, but, but apostasy is a big fancy word. You impress your friends. What it means is you, 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 you've lost faith. You, you started out good, but something distracted you. And you stepped away from what you used to believe in. The Israelites believed that God was faithful and that he was going to bring them somewhere and do something good for them and provide for them. But they were distracted because it was hot and they were thirsty and hungry and tired and so they complained and they got distracted and they, they stepped away from their faith. And they disbelieved. We're going to see a couple more examples of people who, who stepped away and walked away from the faith. Just like Jews talking about these people in the Old Testament, same thing with these false teachers. These teachers probably started out good on the right path, but then they saw, hey, let's, let's go this way. Let's be distracted by this. Let's not stick with what this says, and let's go this direction and leave the faith. Verse 6, And the angels who 
did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he's kept chained or kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So the angels created beings at the beginning of the world, created beings to serve God, but given the ability to choose right or wrong. In your notes, in your bulletin there, it's got two verses, Isaiah and Ezekiel. We'll just look up the one in Isaiah. So if you split your Bible in half, you'll land somewhere in Psalms or Proverbs. Keep going to the right. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song, and then Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. So God creates the angels. He creates Satan. He creates the angels, and he gives them the choice. You can choose to follow me and serve me, or you can choose to rebel. Now, this passage that we're going to look at here is specifically talking about the kings of Tyre and Sidon. If you look up this one and the one Ezekiel, I encourage you to look those up later. They're talking about the, the, the kings of Tyre and, si, uh, Tyre and Babylon, but symbolically referencing to the angels and Satan. And so we look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, this is the problem. This is why the angels got kicked out. This is why the king of, of Babylon gets kicked out. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assemblies on the utmost high of Mount Zephon. I will ascend to the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You don't get to do that. You don't get to, to claim the same role as God. And so as we, you, you can look it up later on. In Ezekiel, the same thing. The temptation and the sin of pride to be equal with God. God steps in and says, that's not, that's not appropriate. That's not how it's going to go. And he cast them out. He drove them out. The same thing is referenced in Ezekiel uh, 28 there. So back to Jude. So we see, we see three examples here. We see the people of Israel complaining. And God says, nope, you got to stay the course. Stay faithful. We see the angels uh, being tempted by pride. God says, you got to stay the course. You can't be tempted with that. And we see these people who are these created beings who are leaving and falling away from the faith. And I have to reflect on my life. When's the last time I grumbled or complained? Oh, it's raining so much. Oh, it's so hot. Oh, it's so winter. Oh, it's so, oh, come on. It's Midwest. It changes every day. You never know what you're going to get. Just deal with it. But we, we complain so much. Oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, I don't have enough. Oh, my kids are not. What? what? Are, are we not satisfied are we not more than grateful with what God has given us? With the blessings he's given to us. And so we complain. The pride that sneaks up in our life, it makes us boastful. Similar to the angels who thought they could be on the same level of God. The pride that sneaks up in our life. Just to, I mean, Maybe we're not claiming, I hope we're not claiming uh, the, the throne of God. But the pride of making ourselves look better than our coworkers. When the boss is around, well, I see they messed up again. I didn't, but they did. Yeah, I would do that with my brothers. I know, it's horrible, right? You guys have never done anything like that. You go ahead, you just get prouder and I'll get humbler, okay? But you, you do it with your brothers and your sisters. It was, it was where we learned it. If they did something wrong and I didn't, I pointed it out and I elevated myself. That's pride, making myself look better. And it tempts each and every one of us. But as a Christian, we follow in the footsteps of Jesus and we humble ourselves and we serve those around us. Let me see the third example here in Jude chapter 1. The third example um, after the angels. In the similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah is a messed up city in the Old Testament. If you look it up, the stories around Genesis 18, around that area there, 18 and 19. Uh, God sends some messengers to Abraham and Sarah to tell them that they're going to have a son. And they think, no way, we're not going to have a son. Sarah's like, I'm so old. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And angel calls her out and says, did you laugh? You don't trust God? And she goes, I didn't laugh. He goes, yes, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Don't do that again. 
But, but Abraham and Sarah are like, okay, so we're going to have a son. We're going to have a family. And then the angels say, hey, well, let's go over and see how your, uh, how your, how your nephew's doing. Oh, let's go check on, because Abraham is the uncle and Lot is the nephew. Let's go check on Lot. And so they go over to, to Lot's city, to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Abraham knows what's coming. He says, okay, God, listen. Listen, when you get there, it's not going to be pretty. So can I ask a favor of you? And God's like, sure. What, what, what's that favor? What do you want from me? He goes, well, I, I'm kind of, I, I, I figure you're probably just going to explode this one and blow it off the map. So what if we find 50 righteous people? Can you spare it for 50? God says, Okay. I can do that. If you find 50 good, righteous people in this city, I'm not going to destroy it. <laughs> Spare me another favor, God. What if we, can, can I talk you down to 45? That man is bold. I mean, he is bold. He does it again and again and again. He goes, he goes 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Man, that guy should be in sales. All right, you're talking God down. And he, and he talks him down to 10. He goes, God, if you can just find 10 people in this city, don't blow it off the face of the earth. I says, right, that's it. That's my final, final decision. No more haggling. Get out of here. Okay, so, so God says his angels, his messengers, go over Sodom and Gomorrah. Check it out. See if you can find 10. The story is not pretty. It's one of those messed up stories in the Bible where you read it and you're like, whoa. How did, how did they get there? When the messengers get to Lot's house, the people of the town see him. And they go, oh, we don't know those people. Who are those people? And they go to Lot's house and they bang on his door and he says, send those men out so that we can have sex with them. Wow. That is a messed up community. And Lot says, no. And they have a back and forth and the angels say, that's it. And they come out with some cool flashbang grenade and they blind everybody. I don't know how they did that, but that would be cool to see. And he looks at Lot and his family. He says, you better run. You're in cross country, right? Because it's about time. To run. And they're like, we can't run. And he's like, just start moving fast. Just go because it's coming and you don't need to be here. So get going. God comes in and takes care of it. But I look at that one and I see the sexual perversion of a city that's so depraved. People come visiting your town and you want to you're going to rape them? And we sit here and in our pride, we look at them and think, how could someone become so sexually deviant and so sexually off and bad? Because my sexual sins aren't bad. I think if you're a human, you struggle with sexual sins in some capacity or another. Lust, flaunting, Adultery, whatever it is. How did that, how did that city, how did Sodom and Gomorrah get there? Because they slowly made a choice. See, sin is, is not a one and done. It's a continuous snare that takes you further and further each time. It takes you further and further each time, and you get further away from the Lord. The sin of complaining the sin, of, the sin, the sin of, um, of pride, the sin of sexual sins, following our evil desires, following our own evil desires, looking at what God has told us to do and saying, look, sex is beautiful for a man and a woman in a married, confined, confined. It's the best option possible. That's where, that's where God created sex, to be in a marriage relationship. And in that context, is a beautiful, good thing. But outside of that, it's a slippery, sinful slope. So Jude says, these, 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 these examples, they've fallen from the Lord. Back to Jude chapter 1. They serve an example of those who have suffered the punishment of eternal fire, those who were on the right track, but because sin enticed them, they fell aside. Verse 8 in, in Jude. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people, they're basing their, their convictions on the strength of their own dreams, their own convictions, not the word. They pollute their own bodies, rejecting authority and heaping abuse on celestial beings. But even the angel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, he did not himself dare to condemn him for, or, or slander him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very thing that they do not understand by instinct, by irrational animals, will destroy them. They do whatever they want. 
They don't submit to God's leadership. Michael the angel says, listen, I'm going to let God take care of this, and I'm going to leave the condemnation to God and let him take care of this situation. But these false teachers in this church, they just say whatever they want to say. They have no basis for their authority. They're just running their mouths. Jude's calling them out. Verse 11, woe to them. Anytime the Bible says woe, you should pay attention. That's a serious warning. It's not like a horse stop. It's like, this is, this is serious business here. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit from Balaam's error. And they have been, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Again, three more examples from the Old Testament that we see here and we go, okay, I don't know these people and I don't know these stories. So let's dig into these three stories to see what they're about. These people, they've taken the way of Cain. What's the way of Cain? Well, what, what's that one? Now, if you remember Old Testament theology here, um, Old Testament um, story here, Cain is in the, in the beginning, all right? Adam and Eve get married, and they have some kids, beautiful little baby boys that always get along. Mm, not so much, not so much. Cain was consumed with anger and envy. That was his downfall. Cain was consumed with anger and envy. See, Abel kept flocks. So Abel was the one who had the, the, the animals, and Cain was a farmer. Cain was a farmer. And one day they came to bring an offering to God, and Abel brought the best that he had. And he offered to the Lord, and God was pleased. He looked down and he said, good job. Cain decided to bring his offering, and it wasn't pleasing to God. But he offered it anyways, and God said, no, that's not what I asked for. And so like brothers do, they get mad. They get envious, and they get mad. It's Cain's fault. He skimped on the offering, but he was going to take it on his brother. And he loses his cool, and he kills his brother. It takes him out because anger takes over his life. And envy, because Abel did it right. Abel was honored, but Cain couldn't couldn't deal with that. So he struggles with anger. He was consumed with it. And so I look at my life and I say, where's the anger in my life? Is it a consuming, sinful, pride-filled anger? That's got to go. And going the way of them, I don't want to go the way of Cain. I don't want to go that way. They have rushed for profit from Balaam's error. Balaam is a great, this is a fun story. Numbers 22 through 24, read this story. It is so fun. I don't have time to get all the details, but it is one of those stories where you're just like, what? Is this literally happening? It is one of the coolest stories. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick recap. The donkey, talk. don't take the, oh, that's a punchline. I can't believe you stole it. There you go. Linda just blew the whole story. But, but listen, this king, Balak, Balak and Balaam, Kak M, got it? Okay, so Kak is the king, you got it? Okay, so Balak is like, um, I'm really worried about the Israelites because they're taking over everybody because God's with them and all these sinful nations are being punished, so I need some help. So Balaam, mm, you're, you're a magician, sorcerer, okay? Why don't you come help me out? I'll pay you handsomely if you come and you curse these people. So why don't you do that? So here, here, you guys go take this money and give it to Balaam, the magician, and see if he'll come over and curse the people. So the, the servants go. And Balaam says, let me, let me think about this. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me see. God says, don't do it. He goes, okay, I can. So he sends the money back. King's like, what? I paid you. Get over here. So he sends him some more money again. So Balaam says, okay, let me see again. God says, go. So Balaam says, all right, I'm going to go this time. I, this, sometimes I'm like, God, what, what are you doing here? Because you said don't go, and now you said go. But on the way that he's going, he's riding his donkey, this great donkey, good, good donkey. And, and, and he's riding on his donkey, and the donkey sees something. The donkey sees an angel. The angel is about to kill Balaam. The angel knows that this is the end. You don't go any further. The donkey says, uh, we're going to take a detour. Takes the detour. Balaam's like, what are you doing, donkey? He starts beating his donkey, and his donkey's like, Argh. so they start walking again. See another angel. This time he, he walks him over to the wall, pushes his leg against the wall, he's beating the donkey again, and then go a little bit more. See another angel again. This time he lays down, on donkey flop, on top of, and he, he's, he's fed up, and he says, listen, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right now. And the donkey turns around and says, listen, buddy, do you see the angel? And Balaam says, no. Th that's amazing. You didn't say wow, you're talking, you just answered the donkey. I think that's hilarious, okay? First time ever, you're done. And he's like, you don't normally do this, the wall pressing knee thing. No, you don't normally talk to me, but he's talking to him. 
If I was Balaam, I'd be like, wow. Okay, someone really high above me is clearly manipulating this whole entire thing. I might want to pay attention to the warning signs, but he doesn't. He doesn't pay attention to the warning signs. Like sometimes he does it right and sometimes he does it wrong. Later on we see that he goes back to Israel and leads them into idolatry. But this is, this is a fun part too. He finally gets there. And Balak, the king, says, all right, do it. And so Balaam gets up there on the hill and he says, I'm here to curse Israel, but I'm going to bless you. Hey, God blesses you all. And he's like, what? That backfired. He does it three times. Three times he gets paid to curse them and he blesses them. The whole story is just totally crazy, but it's fun. But I walk away from it and I say, was greed a part of that story? Because I think it was. I think money moved that man's heart and he avoided the the warning signs, talking donkeys, God telling you no. Well, God, can, we, can, can I ask you again? Why don't you just take no the first time? Why would you ask him the second time? Because I wanted the money. The warning signs. The power of money. What's the power of money in your life? Number two, uh, Balaam was consumed with greed and with sorcery. The power of money, the power of greed in our life is, 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 is money... The number one thing? Well, well, definitely not. Okay, then let's talk about giving. Um, let's not talk about giving because I don't want to. Why? L- listen, giving is between you and God. What you give here to the church is between you and God. And I don't know what you all give. I don't, and I'm so glad about that. I don't, I don't want to know. But that's between you and the Lord. But why do preachers preach about giving? Well, because they want the lights to be on and they want to get paid. We preach about giving because your heart needs to be in check. Because my heart needs to be in check. Because in my life I have a list of priorities. And God is supposed to be on the top. But sometimes God falls from the top and money goes to the top. And if money is the number one thing in my life, then it changes my heart and I start to operate like Balaam. And I, and, I, and I disregard the warning signs. When God says, listen, that's not the right order. I disregard those warning signs and I say, I love money more than my family, more than God, and that's not the right order. And that will lead us to walk away from the faith. That will lead us to all sorts of evil. It will ruin your life. So why does the church talk about giving? Because we want your heart to be in the right order. We want you to say, God, I love you so much that you're the top of my life that I'm going to make you a priority and I'm going to give to you. My hands are off this money. You gave it to me in the first place. You gave me the body to to make this money. You let me live in America where I can have a job and make a really, really good living compared to the rest of the world. And so I'm going to give. And I'm going to give you this money because I worship you with my checkbook and my life. We put it in. Because greed is not the number one in our life. The last one that he mentions here is the rebellion of Korah. The rebellion of Korah, they've destroyed in, the, in, in Korah's rebellion. Korah got some guys together in number 16. He got some guys together. He became insolent and rose up against Moses. He said, we're sick and tired of you God-appointed leader. We're, we've, we've had it. We think that our own plans are the best plans possible. And so we're going to fight you, Moses. We're we're, going to impeach you. Uh, We're done with you. And Moses says, fine. You want to play this game? We'll do it like this. You get your party together. You stay in there. He goes, if you die of natural causes, then God didn't select me. But if God causes something else to happen then be reminded that God chose me as the leader here. I don't know if he did it in such a vindictive way as the way I just told you, so make sure you read it. But Moses backs up, as does everybody else, and and literally the ground opens up and and then closes. Everybody goes, oh, that was not the right choice. And so we see rebellion against God's appointed leaders. So that's why you have to fear me. No, 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 no. Not at all. Not at all. Listen, I'm a, I, I'm a sinner saved by grace, called by the Lord to speak his truth. And I welcome you to challenge me. 
because I need to be challenged. I remember when I was a youth minister, I was, I was, I was talking with the kids one evening, and I was like, yeah, so in First Timothy, blah, blah, blah. And, and so when Timothy is writing this letter to the, to the people of the church, and this young lady, she raises her hand, and I was really, I was like, what could you possibly share? She's kind of, woo And I was like, uh. She raises her hand, she goes, Mike. And I go, what? And she goes, it's not written by First Timothy. It's not by Timothy, it's by Paul. And I was like, what? I was like, oh, you're right. <clears throat> it is. Thank you so much, young lady. She was right. I was wrong. And, and I listened to her. And she was correct. So that's appropriate. But when we look, we're in Jude. If you go to Hebrews, go to Hebrews 13. It's just a couple pages to the left. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. These are really small books here. Hebrews is kind of big. It's like 13 chapters long. But first and second, uh, first, second, third John, all those, uh, first and second Peter, those are real short ones. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. In, in, in the, the Christian church, churches of Christ, uh, the, the, the preacher is, um, that's me, um, I'm not the head of the church. This isn't like a CEO position where I just bark orders. That's not how it works. This church is, is led by shepherd leaders, by elders. There's a group of elders that I submit to, and those are the leaders of this congregation. And I say shepherd leaders because they are the ones who oversee and watch and care for you. That if I'm teaching crazy stuff, that they come in and say, Mike, that's not appropriate. And we're asked that you clean it up, clear it up, or move along. Uh, and, and so I submit to their leadership. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. You might say, well, why do you do that? Because it's biblical. Chapter 13, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For what would be, for that would be of no benefit to you. So I submit to their leadership because they are in charge of watching over me. I talk about shepherd leadership as the one who must give an account. Because one day they'll stand before God and they'll say, I felt called to fill the role of an elder. And I accepted that call, and I led as a servant leader. And our job is to, is, to, is to submit to that, to let them be the leaders, to let them be the shepherds of the church, to make sure that they are keeping us in track and doing that. And so we submit to their leadership. The last part back in the book of James, or Jude, let's finish it out. Jude, uh, Jude chapter, tw- uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Just talking again about these false leaders here in the church and how they distracted themselves and going in the way of the Old Testament uh, stories that are true. Verse 12, these people are blemishes at your love fest, eating without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. That's not a shepherd who takes care of his flock. That's a false leader. There are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted twice dead. I think that's an interesting description of apostasy. They were dead in their sins once, but then they came to salvation. But then something distracted them again, and they, they stepped away from their faith. Listen, I, I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, what if I've apostatized? What if I've fallen away from the faith? Uh, that verse Jeremiah read earlier, God's love. God's love is massively huge. I can't even describe it. And, and, and when we talk about walking away from the faith, uh, 2 Peter uh, 3.17, that we could fall from our secure position. I think that's a great description of it, that we could fall from our secure position because when I'm secure in the Lord, I'm secure in his love for me, his, his amazing, massive amount of love that he has for me that, that wants me to stay in that relationship. The Holy Spirit's draw to keep me in that relationship keeps me secure. But if for some messed up reason, I'm distracted for a long enough time because greed, because greed, because pride, because of sexual sins, because of anger, whatever it is. And I start to slowly turn away and slowly turn away and say, you, you know what, I'm, I'm done at this point. And I cut myself off. The odds are stacked against me that I won't. But if over time I choose that, then I can walk away and I can become twice dead once I was dead in my sins but now I'm alive in Christ but then I was enticed by sin again and slowly I walked away and I left 
and I'm dead again. There are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shames, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved. Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict them all of all the ungodless acts they have committed in their ungodliness, of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These false teachers were teaching that it doesn't matter how you live. You can live however you want. It doesn't make a difference, and that's not true. But I want you to listen to this last part here. These people are grumblers. Oh, we already heard that, didn't we? That's the Israelites, wasn't it? These false leaders are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. That sounds a lot like sexual sins, doesn't it? But it's what I want to do. Well, you don't get to do what you want to do. But I, I, listen, they follow their own evil desires. What, that, that, that sounds exactly like the men in Sodom and Gomorrah. Bring those men out so we can do what? We can have sex with them because that's what they wanted to do. And there, there, there was no restraints on their sexual impulses. There was nothing stopping them except for a door. That, that, is, that is perversion to the furthest extent. And they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. And they boast. That sounds a lot like Lucifer, doesn't it? And the angels, we want to be as high as God. We are conceited and pride-filled. And they fall. The Lord is coming to judge everyone. He's coming. He's coming with that crew. And at that point, it will make a difference. It will make a difference of how we lived. It will make a difference of if we call Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our life. If we listen to what he said when Jesus offered salvation and said, listen, if you believe that I'm the Son of Man, if you turn from your sin and you're baptized, your sins will be forgiven and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will be brought back to life. And once we're in that saved state, we have to remain in that saved state. The Holy Spirit does all the work for us. We have to continue to be obedient and follow him. So I encourage you today, if you've never made that decision, to make that decision. I'm gonna pray. God, we thank you so much. We thank you that you give us uh, stories from the Old Testament that are true, that we can look at them and say, okay, lesson learned, don't live like that. Woe to those people. I pray that we can look at the warnings and we can listen to the signs and we can live a different life because of that. God, we praise you so much for all that you've done and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I said it earlier. I'll say it again. I'll say it a million times until I'm dead. It starts with the relationship with Jesus Christ. If you need to make that, that choice today, please do so as we stand and sing our song.